yeah, as the title already kind of spoiled, I did manage to hit my goal weight. It would have been pretty embarrassing if I had strung you along for three videos and just to fail at the finish line. So first a little recap of the build to see how I reached that weight and after that I think I owe you at least some first impressions. Yeah, I know, I said I, I will tell them. I won't give you my final thoughts though because there's still some stuff in the works which I will explain a bit later on. But first let's do the build recap. After doing quite a few build videos where I go through every single step down to cutting the brake hoses, I thought it was time to mix it up and do an express edition, only focus on what I think is worth pointing out, what is specifically unique to this bike and what will take it down to that final weight. If you want a full walkthrough tutorial on stuff like cutting and installing brake hoses, brake bleeds, fork cutting, DI2 routing, etc, etc, feel free to check out any of my previous build videos. I will also include a spreadsheet down in the description with the full build list pretty much down to the bolt, complete with weights. And speaking of weights, we could start with the frame weight as a reminder for those who haven't seen the previous episode, 1373.3 grams for the frame. For the records, we set the goal for a naked frame at 1400 grams before the build. Needless to say, I'm very happy with the outcome. Now, as you saw a moment ago, I was working on the rear brake, making sure a phone tube was on the hose through the down tube. Don't want any of that rattle noise even if it costs me 10 grams. The group set is coming over from my Trekamunda, which means it's the Dura Ace 9270 12 speed group, minus the crank, which is the THM Clavicula SE. And as you can see here, the frame has a direct mount hanger, so I can ditch that B link on the derailleur. Overall, a few grams saved, even if the hanger itself is a few grams heavier than the standard version. With all the hoses and DI2 cables in place, at this stage I could install the bottom bracket. Since this is a titanium frame, unlike other frame materials, anti-seize or copper paste will take the place of normal grease on all interfaces where titanium meets aluminium. Well, aluminium. Whatever. I'm not native. Those materials can marry for life if you let them, and not having any copper paste is like having a divorce without the prenub. Shit can get nasty. I'm sorry for, for that, that was that was weak. Since copper paste has a tendency to just about get everywhere you don't want it to be, using a small brush to apply it is my tip of the day. The bottom bracket of choice for me is the THM T47 external bottom bracket. After living with the THM clavicular crank for a couple of years now, using a few different bottom brackets, it's definitely the simplest to just go with the THM bottom brackets as they seem to be slightly narrower than say a Chris King or a Token for example. Uh, I will explain more on this as we get to the crank installation. But first, moving over to the front of the bike and the Data DCR cable routing system. As you can see, the hoses will go through the top headset bearing. And yes, grumpy old mechanics will never stop whining about this. It's fine, go back to your old quill stems, down to shifters if that makes you happy. Although I'm sure you'll find something else to complain about. But for me, this is a non-issue. I gladly accept the extra time it takes to work on my bike to get the hidden cables any day of the week. But yeah. After the top bearing, I could pop the split ring in place, which in the case of the Data DCR is this beefy composite, or is it plastic? I don't know. A piece with the space in the front for the cables. No sharp edges to worry about, like some metal split rings might have. And it also saves a few grams over the FSA ACR system, for example. The Data headset top cover is the specific one made for the Data Superbox stem and the integrated Data Alenera handlebar. Alenera. So to use it with my Smoke TLO stem, I have this custom 3D printed cable guide made by Equilibrium as well. 
this is the cleanest 3D print I've ever seen in person. It seriously looks like an injection molded part. And while you think it would weigh like 30 grams or something, it's actually only 16 grams. Apparently printed with some new fancy military grade resin. Not my area of expertise and not much is to be fair. Together with the stem though, it's only 106 grams. I'll quickly move past the expander in a futile attempt to avoid the YouTube Cycling Dad's fear-mongering. Instead, onto something else they can freak out about, and that is the Schmolke carbon shift lever clamps. These replace the titanium clamps on the Dura-Ace levers and saves a whopping 7.3 grams. I'll let you decide for yourself if that's worth it. It is. It's always a good day when I can use this shift lever jig thingamajing. I have a separate video for those who want to know more and embrace your inner voice of unreason. So the front derailleur, yes, I'm running to buy on this bike to start with. I'm eagerly awaiting to see what Shimano has in store for 12 speed one buy options. But for now, since there's no brace on mount on this frame, a derailleur clamp has to be used. And instead of the 30 plus gram for the Shimano's official clamp, I decided to try a generic carbon clamp coming in at 7.3 grams, which was about 10 bucks converted. Uh, that's probably the best value per weight saved on this bike, I realize. Not that that has been the focus, but still. To be honest, I wasn't too confident it would work that good, especially since the max torque rating is only 3 Nm. So I put a good amount of carbon paste on before tightening it down, and I have to say it has been holding up absolutely fine the first couple of rides at least, and from what I can tell it hasn't moved a single millimeter, but with these kinds of parts, time will be the judge, I guess. Now, with the THM crank paired with the THM bottom bracket, you are good just sticking with the spacers as specified in the manual. That is 2mm on the drive side and 1mm on the non-drive side. That will align the cone sleeve in the perfect position, lining up the edge of the sleeve with the splines on the spindle. Like I mentioned before, with other bottom brackets, I've found the cone sleeve has been a millimeter or so off which meant I had to tweak the spacers to get the cone sleeve to align correctly with those blinds. It's not impossible, but it's more of a hassle compared to just using the THM bottom bracket. After the brakes was properly bled, again, I've done in-depth videos uh, on this before, so I'll put some links in the description for those who want a full tutorial. But after that, the marginal gram hunt was on, starting with the caliper bolts. I'm going with titanium bolts and washers. Again, titanium mating with aluminium calipers means copper paste. Total weight for both the front and the rear hardware was 8.6 grams with the length I needed. That's about half the weight of the standard caliper bolts. I lose the function of the little safety pin on the rear. It's not an issue for anyone who regularly inspects their bike but I thought I should at least point it out. Now, I'm a die-hard fan of the Arundel mandible carbon cages. In my opinion, there's no better cage out there, both in terms of retaining your bottles, keeping the bottles from scratching the frame, and it's pretty much the best looking cage, in my opinion, on any bike. But it's not the lightest, so I decided to try these Topeak Feza R10 which as you can guess by the model name is 10 grams a piece. While obviously taking inspiration from the carbon work cages, these have one very important improvement and that's the optional centerpiece between the bolts that will protect the frame when inserting and removing the bottle. It's especially important for this frame because of the frame finish, which I will talk about later. Again, aluminium bolts into titanium means copper grease. Cages installed, and then I realized the C-tube case sits too low for the bottle. It can't slide all the way down. And since you only have one hole in these, there's no adjustments opportunities either. This was obviously punishment for abandoning my beloved mandibles. So no need to fight the will of the universe. Back to my tune mandibles, 
but at least I could use some of these short silver aluminium carbon tie bolts. Around 3 grams for all four, bringing the total for two cages with bolts to about 45 grams. In the end, I'm kind of happy it turned out that way, despite extra weight. I love the mandibles too much, man. Can't help it. I get a lot of questions about what bar tape I use. And it's the most super light, and I don't mean that as a... It's the most super lightest bar tape in the world. It's actually the most, the brand, which is from Pinarello, and the model name is Super Light. It's a very comfy 3mm thick tape. For reference, this wrap was only 33 grams without plugs. It's definitely not the most durable tape in the world, but you can't have everything, I guess. The bar and plugs is something different though. These 3D printed holo plugs from Lucendi are 1.8 grams for the pair, and it's not even the lightest version. But I prefer these with a slightly larger lip. It holds the bar tape in place as well as making a bit harder to get a muscle biopsy if you would ever jam your leg into the bar for whatever reason. So check out Lucendi on Instagram if you want to know more about these plugs or get yourself a pair. As for the wheels, I've already done a separate video dedicated to the 1060 gram wheel set that will go with this bike. It's a huge part of bringing this bike to my weight goal, so if you missed that, feel free to check it out as well. And as a reminder, if you think I left out something important, again, check the spreadsheet in the description and hopefully you'll find your answer there. But now, only one thing left to do, the final way in with pedals, bottle cages and computer mount included, of course, like you always should do when specifying bike weights. Let's see. <laughs> So as you can imagine, I'm pretty damn happy with the final weight. As soon as I got confirmation on the frame weight, I knew I would go, yeah, quite a bit under my original goal. Uh, I know I said we set the goal weight uh, for the frame at 1400 grams, but in the back of my mind, I had a buffer that I knew like even if the frame would come out to say 1500 grams, I would still be able to hit that 6.8. But in the end, happy days, sub 6.6, .6. I'm not complaining. Now there's one thing I was a bit worried about, and I mentioned this in the first video, and that is, will the THN stem fit this frame, like visually, nicely, pull it all together? I knew I had to try, because I knew it would really bug me to death if I didn't try. But I do think it looks slightly out of place. Uh, Equilibrium did such a nice job on the DCR stem adapter, but I think it kind of, yeah, it's not the best fit for this frame visually. I know Schmolke now makes this stem with uh, support for fully internal brake hoses, but that would mean I would need a new handlebar as well, and I'm not sure that would make much of a difference anyway. And frankly, after shelling out for a custom titanium frame, my wallet is not ready for another $800 to $1,000 spend for a new cockpit. Uh, it definitely needs some recovery time first. So for now, I will keep the cockpit as it is, uh, but it's always good to have areas to play with in the future. Other than that, I'm super happy with how the bike turned out visually. I just love the contrast between the brushed titanium and the glass blasted surface. Exactly what I wanted and of course a little bit of color with it anodizing. Vlad did warn me about the glass blast though. Uh, it would be a challenge to keep it clean. And he was not lying. The glass blasting is so much finer than the regular sandblast finish, giving it that really light and nice look. It almost has like a diamond look if you look really close, but it's an absolute magnet for anything, basically, even your fingerprints. And since that structure is so fine, you can't really go really rough with a brush or anything like you can do on a normal titanium finish. But tell me something is hard to clean and I will take that challenge. That is how my brain is wired. But I would not recommend this to anyone that really doesn't enjoy cleaning their bike. That's for sure. 
Maybe a titanium cleaning bike video in the future though. Not a bad idea. So, first ride impressions. I did mention in the last video that I would try two different forks or two different versions of this fork with different offsets, which uh, in, in reality would mean two different trail figures uh, with a difference about five millimeters. I've only tried one of these forks yet, so I will refrain from talking too much about the handling. I will make a separate video uh, when I have ridden both forks and decided which one to keep and then go into all the nitty gritty of what that actually means. Trail. But what I think some of you are curious about, uh, judging from the comments, is how titanium rides in comparison with the previous bikes I have, which all been carbon. So the day before I finished this build, I actually went out on my Allied Echo uh, to get a, like a proper reference point. The Echo is set up with 32 mm slicks and this has uh, 28 mm slicks. So I didn't really know how well it would compare really. But first things first, the bike feels like a sub 6.8 bike, which was kind of a relief. I know that sounds weird, but I was I was kind of worried it would feel like a tankish climbing, but it felt as nice and nimble as any other bike I had, bar maybe the Trekamonda at 6.1 kilos. The road buzz though. And I know this is annoying reading all the titanium converts speaking about how nice it rides and you can't feel anything and blah blah blah. I was pretty skeptical about all that voodoo shit as well, to be fair, but it is kind of true, I have to say. When rolling along, I feel less of the road buzz, I feel less of the joints in the tarmac on this titanium bike with 28mm tires than I do on my Echo with 32mm tires. So in a way it feels like I'm riding a bigger tire than I actually am, but still keeping that nice and nimble feeling of a, of a smaller tire. That is up to a certain point. Once the road gets rough enough, you definitely get reminded that you are only on 28s and not 32s. But as for road vibrations, this is absolutely perfect for the kind of rides I do. Yeah, long all day ride in the mountains, perfect. I have about 550k on this bike now and once I have my fork experiments completed uh, I will do another video going more in depth to the handling aspects of this as well as covering some of the other new components like wheels and stuff like that. As for descending, which is a huge part in my riding, the fork decision will play a huge part in that as well so I won't say too much now but I can at least spoil, I have improved some times on descents that I already have the KOM on. Yeah, I'm not disappointed, I can say that much for now. But I will definitely dive into that deeper in the next video, hopefully with some descending clips. But until then, tie is fly, keep it upright, drink water and peace. I won't give you my absolute...